Geo, welcome to Cherokee Now. Today we have Lamar Marshall joining the show. Lamar is the research director with the Southeast Heritage Associates. Lamar, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. I'm blessed to be here. Absolutely. Well, tell me a little bit about the Southeast Heritage Associates and your role as a research director. Well, Southeast Heritage itself was formed about a, oh, two years ago out of all the research that I've been doing with the tribe, for the tribe, through nonprofits for the last 25 years. Uh, a lot, some of the work was done under Wild South, the former uh, organization I was with, as a cultural resource director. But I've spent about nine years now uh, working uh, with the tribe and building relationships and friends okay. and working with the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, the Cultural Resources Office, meeting the elders, uh, climbing over the mountains with Jerry Wolf <laughs> about eight years ago, who could outrun me when he was 80. He's, um, he's quite the man, isn't he? Yes, he is. So tell me a little bit about your background. Now, you came from Alabama, is my understanding. Is that correct? Right. I'm uh, from Alabama. The last 25 years, I've uh, worked with uh, nonprofit organizations in cultural heritage preservation okay. and conservation. Um, my background was in engineering and surveying. Okay. Which uh, made it really um, work out really nice to research trails. And years ago, I got in, uh, I joined the uh, North, I mean, the Alabama Trail of Tears Association. Okay. Became a board of director, and I mapped 200 miles of the Binge Detachment across North Alabama that is now in the National Historic Trail System. Gotcha. With the National Park Service. When I moved up here into Franklin, um, I, I joined the North Carolina Trail of Tears Association and met Dr. Brett Riggs, who's done much work up here. Right. And met so many people that that uh, I just fit right in, I guess, with the trails material. And so you came in and you were, you were asking at the time, has, has anybody mapped the Trail of Tears on the North Carolina side? And what, what kind of answers were you getting? So uh, Russ Townsend, he said, to his knowledge, no comprehensive uh, trails work had ever been done, huh. trails here and there. So I proposed that why don't we do a project uh, uh, funded either through the National Park Service or the Preservation Foundation that we uh, we get out there in the field and find every historic map, every early survey, talk to every Cherokee elder that can remember where their granddaddy told them there was a trail right. over the mountains, record this information, get out in the mountains and walk the, the trails, find the trails, and, and you can actually be in a deep embedded old ancient Cherokee trail and you're looking at the mountains and the, and the ridge tops, and you're seeing the same exact viewpoint that they saw. You know, really? Say, that's what really uh, touched Hundreds you. of years ago. So tell me about what the Story Map Project is. It came out of all this, right? Right. This, uh, there was a series of grants. We worked a couple of years on um, mapping the Cherokee trails, okay. getting all the graphics and the maps, and then I created maps. And then I realized, hey, we need more supporting data. Uh, one thing the tribe was lacking was a their their historic archives. Gotcha. Now, we got some of them here and there, but mm -hmm. um, so we got a, a grants to go to Harvard University, to the Newberry, to NARA, to all over the United States, finding and recording. We, uh, I think we photographed about 150,000 digital images of Cherokee wow. archives. Much of this has never been published. Much of this has uh, geographical information in it and ecological information that has never never been, been shared. So we, I'm gleaning from all this data and have reconstructed uh, Cherokee trails, mapped them, uh, Cherokee town sites, about 60 Cherokee towns and uh, village sites. Wow. Uh, found some uh, uh, sacred sites in the forest that uh, I don't think that nobody... That we, we don't talk about and share, but... Yeah, and uh, some, uh, the ones we found now the, near the Hiawassee River were giant salamanders carved in rocks. And I don't know, but a very few old, you know, old timers around the mountains over there that even know about those. Really, that is exciting. And so the Story Map Project was funded eventually. Story Map Pro uh, Project was funded this last uh, grant cycle with the Cherokee Preservation Foundation. Okay. And they were probably thinking, you know, hey, it's about time he pulled all this stuff together. <laughs> Start putting here. it together, and doing something. You know, fund him forever. So I said, this is it. We're going to take. We're going to. Um, map every, all this stuff into a series of hist historical maps. Okay. Well, I'd say historical stories. Uh, and over the course of time, I, I, I recognized that in 1700, the Cherokees were hunting buffalo. They were going to Kentucky. They were going to Tennessee. They had this vast territorial claim, about eight or nine states. Wow. So I began there, and I said, okay, I found 10 historical errors that we could m put on, the, on paper. Okay. The first being their territorial claim. Uh, their towns and their trails. Okay. And then the second uh, uh, thing that I wanted to introduce, because about the same time, the Europeans began 
moving in, and right. the traders started trading. Okay. So trade is a very important uh, factor in what happened to Cherokee. To the story, the, where the story goes. That's right. And the third, um, I think the third uh, story map, I focus on nothing but Cherokee trails. Okay. The fourth uh, story map is, a. Uh, let's see. Got so many now, I can hardly keep up with them. <laughs> the fourth one was the ecology of the Cherokees. Oh, there were strawberry plains. There were uh, this place was a uh, was a paradise. The mountains were thirty percent uh, chestnut trees. Wow. And buffalo, elk, bear, everything. Right here, where we're at. To live, it was a paradise, and the Cherokee were free. Awesome. And that's the thing that I admired, and what really got me motivated to to get interested in all this early on was, man, this was the freest people on earth. Until, like us today, the technology has crept in, and here we are sitting in an office every day, yeah. you know. Where in the old days, you know, you'd be out hunting right <laughs> That's now. That's right. Whatever. Farming, hunting, uh, you know, building. Us. Okay, so um, why the 1700s? Was was that just was that kind of the point where everything was most expanded? And I wanted to start with the historical era. Okay. And before, about 1680 is when the first... Uh, contact with the Cherokees, with the Europeans, became okay. and the trade started cranking up. Before that, there's no written history okay. about the Cherokees. Uh, before that, they were like this mysterious uh, tribe of people over the mountains, you know, right. and the people on the coast would hear stories about these uh, mountain Cherokees, but there very little contact. And so it, it was just oral stories that were shared, that's, and that's about as far back as we can get to things with the Cherokee that, right. accurately. And, and it's not to say we weren't here or didn't exist, but it's just to say that accurately. Oh, no, there are tens of thousands of years but prior to that. Now, you can talk to Dr. Brett Riggs or somebody like that, and you get the archaeology. Okay. And, you know, all the different periods, uh, you know, paleo up to the archaic and the woodland and Mississippi. Right. And, but uh, for your research, we started 1700 because that's historically when we started having that documented a little bit better, I guess, and, and especially that's, with the trade. And the historic maps, a lot of these early maps that were hand-drawn by explorers, they contain very – they have things about, like, the Appalachian tribe was destroyed in 1712 by the – there's the ecological and historical wow. data in, in these maps. Excellent. So I'm gleaning all that out, too, uh, and especially interested in the, the buffalo. That yeah. the buffalo was here. The Cherokees had a buffalo dance. Uh, not a lot of uh, archaeological evidence of buffalo, but tons and tons of, of historical accounts and chronologies written down about it. Really? How about, uh, okay, so, so adding on to this, you're talking about the Cherokee trails, the Cherokee towns. Are those layers of the story maps, or are they individual yes. projects? How do, they, how do you uh, look at those? Okay, the first thing I had to do, um, I mapped a lot of things in, in Google Earth Pro and then the okay. mapping, various mapping uh, programs with doing GPS, and et cetera. So I had waypoints and uh, survey notes. When uh, I met David, uh, David White at the Tribal GIS, he gave a presentation uh, I'm, a, I'm a founding uh, board member with the Koala Boundary Historical Society, okay. which I think everybody needs to get involved Absolutely. with this. This is a great, a great group of people. And uh, David got a presentation. He said, I asked him, I said, is there a way to map all of this history that we've got? He said, yes, you can put it into online. You can put it in these new story map templates that they have uh, developed. And he uh, got me started, okay. showed me how to do this. And my, my challenge was to take all the prior uh, the GPS, KML, KMZ files, and convert them to layers and things that would work, shape files that would work in the GIS. Gotcha. So I was been learning and learning and more learning. And, and it took us about a year and a half now, I think, to, to get this thing laid I gotcha. out. So awesome. I've got 10, I've actually got 12 or 14 uh, story maps that are almost finished. Okay. And will be released uh, very shortly. And that, and that was leading into my next question. Um, how would the public utilize these these awesome story maps and these projects that you've been working on? And when would when would you expect them to come online? Within about two to three weeks, the first ten stories. Okay. Uh, I mean, all you gotta do is hit the, the the public button. I can't. I don't have the authority to do that. Uh, number one, I want Russell Townsend, right. T.J. Holland, and the you know these people, my peers to uh, they gotta need to sign off on it. The elders need to see them. I don't think there's anything sensitive or, okay. or archaeological uh, that it, that are in my story maps pretty general because okay. we'd like for the world to see the, right. the history of the Cherokees and the world to come here to see Cherokee Absolutely. And, and, to, and to get involved in cultural tourism. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one thing, but there's a two-fold uh, aspect to it, I guess you could say. Part of this material is going to be very useful to the tribe. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if they want to have it, have part of the, of the materials open to the, to the world and then part of it for Cherokees right. who are doing genealogical research. Uh, it could be done very easily that way. You can okay. have specific databases that they can get into. 
but the general public worldwide and the World Wide Web, we want them to see the general history, right. you know, and the so you create a, a public the domain world. side of it where you just allow the public, general public to see it and then uh, keep right. a more restricted, tighter uh, piece of the information for the folks here to do their genealogical research and whatnot on. Well, and, and the beauty of this, and I'll interrupt you, but the beauty oh, you're of this fine. is that, that uh, early on the foundation told me, said, we don't want projects done that's going to sit in a pigeonhole on a bookshelf over right. here, like a dissertation or something. Uh, that is not what we want our, our youth. We want the Cherokee children who, if the Cherokee cultural heritage is going to live, has got to live in the hearts and the minds of the Cherokee right. youth. So I'm thinking, okay, the youth today, I'm having a hard time with them because they're going around with these iPhones and all this stuff, but they don't have very long attention stands. That's right. But if I can take uh, uh, 20 years of history and put it in a, in a, in a, in a two-minute presentation with graphics, pictures, maps, and, and things that they're used to seeing, right. they're going to learn, learn very fast. Absolutely. And maybe get an interest and and you know go further well i'd love for you to come back on once this gets the green light and we start to roll it out and uh, and for those that are are watching uh, we're estimating probably the beginning of the new year 2018 yes uh, when this oh, will probably yes. roll out yeah they we've got i mean you can see it's the built uh, and i can see it here there. and we can we can uh when, once you can share this with the public I, I think come back on and let's go through it maybe story by story okay. uh episode by episode and talk about these interesting uh histories that the public need to know about and and you're right and and the foundation's right about this it's something we've talked about on the show before with other guests um this history this culture is embedded in the stories uh that are, that are told by our ancestors um and there's certain value sets that are in there that we have lost um uh, connection with that we need to get back and and it might be an answer to some of our social problems that we have and experience today uh you know with drug use or, or crime or whatnot maybe looking at our history looking at our culture through these stories and seeing what our connection to that is and what that means and really give us a sense of purpose and value and, and belonging to this tribe like we we all should have uh so thank you for that work what is it like um working on this what are you what are you going through on a oh, day-to-day a, routine early on it was like a, uh, am i uh, working or am i on vacation i'm out in the mountains <laughs> i'm out here walking it is rough work but yeah uh, and it was but it's fun work it's, a, it's a, i'm passionate about it this is my culmination of my life's work right i'll be 70 years old in september i've uh, retired from my other jobs and everything i work full-time on this if i'm not funded for a period of time i keep right on working you just day. keep working because you love it um, and you're passionate about it that's great. Absolutely. Now, are you out in the woods still quite a bit, or are you are you a lot more less in? than I used to? I, <laughs> I still go out and verify some of the trails and and things before we, uh, you know, publish them. Yeah. But uh, to, th- wh- there's some areas of history here that are going to blow people's minds. I mean, when you get up past the, the traders, you got the land speculators that uh, after the revolution, you got two Cherokee wars, major wars that we cover. Then the speculators come in after the American Revolution. And they're what's driving the politics. They're the, they're the ones that are pushing to get the Cherokees removed. They, right. want, they want these vast holdings of land so they can make money off of them. That's the speculators area. And then after that, you've got uh, uh, the Cherokee citizens of 1817, 1920. These uh, uh, Cherokees were made American citizens, mm-hmm. given 640 acres of land, and the whites here, uh, re- what do you call it, subdivided their lands and sold them out from under them. And people came over and like, hey, I bought this piece of land, but there's a Cherokee family on a farm sitting right here. Well, I've got affidavits and hundreds of court documents that are in these records showing how that vigilante groups came in and burned down and took houses. Uh, one woman named Nancy Reed said, we fled our homes by the burning flames of, you know, of our houses in the night when they, they set our houses on fire. And they, it wasn't all like that, but there were many cases. There are many cases were. like that. What what are what would you say are the top? Because there's so many interesting stories. I know you've come across over the last nine or twelve years, however many years you've been working on this. How how long has it been now? So nine years uh, here. Here, counting the years, and then the years Alabama. back in Alabama. What what would you say here are maybe the top two or three most interesting things to you? Just real quick, um, abbreviated versions of them. what? What are some of the most interesting things you've come across with stories? Well. I said, that'd be hard. Oh, well, I, I guess to, to take the, that I found uh, eight or nine journals that were written by hand in the uh, in 1761, 1776, and others, and and to be able to uh, to go mile by mile and foot by foot on the ground with these journals where they're recording. We crossed over this creek. We went over like 20 minutes, and we crossed over another creek. And you found that, and were able to trace it in GIS. You can replot it. So to wow, me, that was a very exciting to be able to get out there and to and to reconstruct these these trails. 
uh, one of the I mean, it's humorous things too when you get back about 1900 and in the old days in yep. Big Cove, um, a, a, a white man got arrested for stealing a Cherokee dog. And Robin and I were in this archives. And I said, Robin, how do you uh, tell a Cherokee dog from a white dog? And I think I don't know if she said it, but I think that, that it was barking in syllabary <laughs> or something like that. But it was, it was funny. <laughs> Some of the things were humorous. Well, uh, good. Okay, so what's next? What's next is to get these 12, I got 12 story maps. I, I, I've got a, the, the Cherokee uh, Nikwasi corridor. I've been working with Mainspring, a uh, conservation group, okay. who is uh, proposing uh, a Cherokee culture corridor from Cherokee that would run, say, down by Fort Lindsay at, a, at a Almond, and then it would go up the Little Tennessee River, which was a Trail of Tears route, by the way, okay. newly discovered by Dr. Brett Riggs. Really? And to uh, connect Nikwasi Mound with uh, Gadua okay. and, and Cherokee here and have uh, historical markers where people will come, you know, and they'll be able to, to, to drive, canoe, or whatever along this corridor. How much of this will you take to the technical side? How much will, be, will we be seeing on iPads and, and apps and things that we'll be able to stand in a location and, and it, it tell us this, it, this is what happened at this location? Is that something that may happen down the road? Well, absolutely, because that's what's coming now. Right. When you drive up to the, uh, to the historical marker where Cowie Town was, and all of a sudden your iPhone comes on and yep. it says GPS, uh, you know, GP, uh, GPS uh, coordinate. Right. Locks in and it says, <laughs> you are approaching, you know, the town of Cowie, which was one of the most important. Cherokee and give you, it starts spilling in, in if you want more. Yeah. Click here and it can take you into a, a bigger, deeper oh, expanse. yes. Links. And then these ten uh, major outlines of history, they can be... I want school teachers to, to take charge. This is of this a lesson. Stuff. This is I want, I want a whole this. curriculum right here in front of us is ready to be delivered to our, our people. Will it be uh, useful in in classroom? Uh, Absolutely. You know, can, kids get on there and they can they can they can see the this visually. That could be a, a, a something that they research. Okay. This is skeletal. They could get in there and then go into the virtual folder and find some of these uh, genealogical records and, and do their own historic report. Yeah, might I be able to it's find something about my my family history on through some of this? Is that something that may down the road be able to be searchable or traceable? Uh, absolutely. Okay. There's thousands of records of valuations and books that are uh, that are that we have digitized now that uh, you'll be able to to look at all the Cherokee families 1835 that were that they uh, that they, they went house to house and they said. This Cherokee uh, standing wolf uh, has got a log cabin that is a 12 by 12. It's got a dirt floor. It's got a, a loom house out back. He's got 12 peach trees. You can reconstruct what the, where the households, like. the farmsteads, and where the town sites were. That's amazing. Without giving out too much information so that people, metal detectors, and looters get out there and, you know, Great. mess with things. Well, that's true. And and I want to get you back on the show. Like I said, I, I think it's important. Once the green light happens on these, come back on. Let's walk through them one by one with the public and, and talk about these things more in depth. It'd be wonderful. Awesome. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? I guess that, that about covers it. We've, uh, it's just uh, it's overwhelming. I mean, I can't wait to get the uh, virtual photo up so that the uh, anybody looking at their family history can get online and look at do it for you know look at it for absolutely themselves. that's exciting for the public well thanks for joining us lamar come on um come on back on like i said once you get this together and uh, and moving forward and let's talk about it again I'd, be, I'd love to more in depth well that'll be it for today uh, if you're listening at home and would like to comment on the show or ask any questions regarding what we've discussed today uh, please comment on our ebci cherokee now facebook page at facebook.com forward slash cherokee now we'll see you again very soon data dog you